Marie, can we please have a roll call? Mrs. Medina? She's got it. Mrs. Rayle? Here. Mrs. Head? Here. Mrs. Lee? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Mr. Bembo? Here. Mr. Krings? Here. Thank you, Marie. Now we'll start with the student representative's report. Krista? Um, winter sports are in full swing and forensics has just started and there's a lot of decision making throughout the students of what college, which colleges they're going to. So. Busy time, I'm sure. Yep. Finals mm -hmm. coming up. Okay, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Okay, I make a motion to approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of November 10th, 2014. Second. A motion to second to approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of November 10th, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, do we have any comments from citizens or delegations tonight, Marie? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to committee reports. John, business services. Thank you, John. Business services met on December 1st, <coughs> and we started our meeting at 6 o'clock. There was no public comment. And we also did not have any consent agenda items. So I will just jump in. We did have a purchases review of uh, 30 iPads. Uh, basically, it was like a Black Friday sale. And we got the, uh, the iPads for, was it $100 off? Yeah. $100 off the normal price wow. to buy them. So um, we uh, purchased those and um, are going to replace, and is that how? It was high school. And then we had a very riveting report of our <laughs> audited financial statement. Uh, of, Dan it, it. <laughs> of, which, <laughs> of which if anybody has any questions, uh, there's certainly uh, I have a copy too. There's uh, plenty of copies of the to look at it. Some good late did, night reading. We did go through it as as we were waiting for <coughs> the other committee to get done. Um, so with that I submit our minute, the balance of our minutes. Second for approval. Second. Okay, motion to second to approve the Business Service Committee meeting minutes of December 1st, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, John. Next, we'll move on to personnel services. Uh, personnel services met last Monday, December 1st, and we um, started at 6, and we did not end until 7.16. It was our longest meeting ever. You know. Okay. <laughs> and from that meeting, we have eight consent agenda items, and they are as follows. Uh, number one, the committee recommends and I move to approve the one professional staff resignation. Second, the committee recommends and I move to approve the one professional staff early retirement. Three, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two support staff assignments. That was three. Four, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 522.8. Cell phone usage for second reading, we had this last month. Um, fifth, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 221.1, recruitment and appointment of superintendent for second reading. That's basically we can only encourage them to live within the district. Sixth, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 323.2, special observance days for second reading. Um, and seventh, the committee recommends and I move to approve policy 323.2, rule special observant days for second reading. And the last one, um, the committee recommends and I move to approve the proposed language changes regarding <coughs> vacation benefits found under the vacation section of the employee handbook for custodians and maintenance staff. And basically it's um, for employees hired on or after July 1st, 2013. Vacation days shall be awarded for use in the same year they're received. Um, employees in their first year of service shall receive a prorated amount of vacation based upon the number of months worked. Um, this is basically impacting three employees right now. <coughs> is there anyone that wants something held out? No. I'll second. Okay, motion is second to approve PS 1 through mm -hmm. 8. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motions carry. Uh, and then, uh, John, we had um, updates and reports. Um, we had some more information on our 2014-15 open enrollment data. And we were just looking at if there was some one big general reason why maybe somebody was leaving our district for another. And when looking at it, they were just all very different reasons. There was no one particular thing that was causing people to leave the district. 
Um, secondly, we had a 2015-16 group health plan renewal. We had discussion. John Price uh, from M3 was there. Um, what he did was there was a question about looking at spousal carve out for our, our insurance. And he basically said that's only going to really work if you're self-insured and it's sometimes more detrimental to the district than saving actual money. And then he gave us a, a kind of a review, a review of our, our um, insurance usage. And just to summarize it, our current loss ratio for the last 12 months with WEA is 105%. So we're using the insurance quite a bit. This is down from the previous year where it was 118%. Um, and just for clarification, they aim for 92%. Mm -hmm. So for every dollar we, we cost them, they're actually paying out a dollar five. Mm -hmm. If you look at it that way, so they're moving in. So that may tell you about something coming up for the coming year. Um, and with that, I move that the minutes from the professional personal <coughs> services committee meeting be approved as printed. I'll second that. A okay, motion is second to approve the meeting minutes from the Personnel Service Committee meeting of December 1st, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? Our minutes are approved. Thank you, Sandy. And we'll move on to Ed Services. Ms. and Mary, you're going to give a I'll do that report. since I have chaired the meeting. Uh, Ed Services met on uh, December 1st, 2014. It was our regular meeting. There were 20 consent agenda items. Does anyone or any of them hold out? Okay, then I recommend, I, the committee recommends, and I move to approve ES1, which was increasing high school graduation requirements for Lincoln High School students from 22.5 to 24 credits beginning with the class of 2017. This increase is necessary due to the high school moving to a trimester schedule. ES2, making the Global Education Achievement Certificate Diploma Endorsement available to Wisconsin Rapids Public School students beginning with the class of 2015. Uh, the, Kathy um, Hence provided examples of ser service projects that students could do when working towards this endorsement. ES3, requiring that all students successfully complete or test out of IT Fundamentals 1 in order to graduate from LHS beginning with the class of 2018. There was a great deal of discussion by the CII committee regarding this proposal. Because of scheduling issues, it was felt students should be able to meet this requirement any time during their high school career. ES4, engineering design and development be added as an elective course option in the technology education department for students at LHS for one credit beginning in 2015-16. This course would be added as a one credit technology education elective and would serve as a capstone course for our project Lead the Way Engineering course series. Okay, ES5, uh, mobility, fitness, and nutrition be added as a one-half credit physical education course that students may take in place of the required physical education one and two for students at the LHS beginning in 2015-16. And this course can be taken for 0.5 physical education credits in place of current PE requirements for students. ES6, English 250 be added as a 0.5 elective language arts course for students at LHS beginning in 2015-16. Uh, there was some concern raised about this regarding potential costs for this course. ES7 was um, exploratory business be added as a nine-week rotation course required of all seventh grade students moving the current comu computer application seven nine-week rotation course to grade six thus eliminating a one-quarter study hall for all sixth grade students. This proposal would take effect in 2016-2017, and this course will replace a study hall currently in the middle school rotation. The FTE cost will come from the dollars utilized to start elementary keyboarding. ES8 was uh, principles of economics be taught utilizing a blended online format beginning in 2015-16. There were concerns, uh, some concerns raised whether the technology department would be able to support this class, mainly with the hardware. ES9, English 101, 102, and 250 may be taught utilizing a blended online format beginning in 2015-16. Uh, concern was again raised as to whether or not our current technology, hardware, and infrastructure can handle this course and others like it. ES10, Digital Electronics, a LHS Technology Education Elective, be offered as a one equivalency course for credit in either mathematics or technology education beginning in the 2015-16. 
This recommendation is pending DPI approval. This course would be a crosswalk between mathematics and technology education. The math department embraced this course. This recommendation is pending DPI approval. ES 11, a advanced placement psychology and LHS social studies elective for one credit instead of one half credit beginning in 2015-16. And it was recommended this course increase from one semester to two trimesters as well as one half to one credit. ES 12, Offering Advanced Placement Calculus BC and LHS Math Elective for one and one half credits instead of one credit beginning in 2015-16. It was recommended this course increase from two semesters to three trimesters as well as from one to one and one half credits. ES 13, to approve Board Policy 343.2, Class Size for First Reading. Uh, updates to this policy are in part due to the new course options legislation along with other state and district initiatives. <coughs> ES 14, to approve board policy 345.11, procedures for academic, academic excellence scholarships for first reading. Uh, this is because LHS will be transitioning to a five period trimester schedule beginning in 2015-16 school year. There is a need to change how academic excellence scholarships are administered. ES 15, to approve Board Policy 345.12, Procedures for Wisconsin Technical Excellence Scholarships for First Reading. This is a new policy as a result of the recent Wisconsin State Legislature authorizing the Wisconsin Technical Excellence Scholarship under 2013 Wisconsin State Act 60, starting with the 2015-16 academic year. ES 16, Approved Board Policy 422, Admission of Non-Resident Pupils for First Reading. Due to a number of recent DPI rules concerning open enrollment, along with statutory changes relevant to course options and K-12 non-resident home-based pupil admission requirements, Board Policy 422, Admission of Non-Resident Pupils, was reviewed for necessary changes. This policy was updated to bring the district into compliance. ES 17, uh, board to approve Board Policy 423, Public School Open Enrollment and Board Policy 423 Rule, Procedures for Processing Public School Open Enrollment Applications for First Reading. The DPI recently finalized major revisions to the administrative rules that implement the state's full-time open enrollment program. These rules, along with changes to what used to be part-time open enrollment, as a result of the new course options law, have caused a need for Board Policy 423, Public School Open Enrollment and Board Policy 423 Rule, Procedures for Processing Public School Open Enrollment Applications, to undergo revisions and has strengthened the language should there be an appeal on an open enrollment decision related to habitual truancy. ES 18, to approve Board Policy 424, participation of non-public school students in programs and district services for first reading and use of the part-time enrollment application form. Non-public school students occasionally request to participate in courses or activities offered by WRPS. Board Policy 424 sets out the procedures non-public school students must follow to allow for and participate in district programs and services. Sandy had questioned if the district would be reimbursed for the students accepted, include, including students attending private schools with vouchers. Maureen Hodgson stated that a percentage of the FTE for the class would be reimbursed by the state, but details aren't yet clear. And ES 19, to approve the modifications of the supplemental pay plan for professional development effective with the 2014-15 school year. The Supplemental Pay Plan for Professional Development was reviewed and additional modifications were explained. Kathy Hintz explained that this should be easier for professional staff to interpret. And ES 20, to approve utilizing curriculum referendum dollars to purchase the Math Expressions Consumable Workbooks for grades K through 4 for 2015-16 and 2016-17 school year at a cost of $91,212.45. Kathy explained that the district was offered a discount by the representative from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt to purchase consumable workbooks for the 2015-16 and 2016 school year at a substantial savings of $28,834.50. Um, does anyone, oh, you didn't want any help though, did you? Yeah, hold, hold okay, on, 18. Hmm? 18. 18? Mm -hmm. 
What, I didn't say to you? You said it. She liked like, like, oh, to hold it out. <laughs> it's been a long day, sorry. Okay, we'll hold out 18. Read it again. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> okay, then we'll hold out 18. Um, so... Let's second the rest of them. Okay, let's second this up. Motion and a second to approve ES1 through ES20 with 18 held out. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Sandy, 18 is... Board Policy 424 Participation of Non-Public School Students in Programs and District Services for First Reading and Use of the Part-Time Enrollment Application. Her name is Rayom. Oh, yes. Should have been roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Yes. Of course you're right. <laughs> we do that again, please? <laughs> Mrs. Rayom? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Head? Yes. Mrs. Medina is not here. Larry Davis? Yes. John Kring? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I do apologize. Okay, Sandy. Um, I just, I guess I want to know the particulars before we go ahead. If we're having, if potentially having voucher students attending here up to two classes, you know, what is the exact reimbursement for the district? So until that is actually known for me, I'm going to vote no on it. Okay. Any? Oh, Maureen. I do just want to say that I do, I'm trying to connect with the DPI and get an answer from someone mm -hmm. down there on that. Maureen. Thank you. That's well, first reading, so hopefully we'll have more information before we have to finalize it. Okay, any other questions then? I guess I would need a motion for that one. And uh, make a motion to approve the ESCT. Second. Okay, a motion and a second to approve ESAT, ES18, um, which was Board Policy 424, Participation of Non-Public School Students in Programs and District Services for First Reading and Use of the Part-Time Enrollment Application Form. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, then we had an update. Uh, Kathy uh, presented a PowerPoint that updated the committee on how funds from the Elementary and Secondary Education Act are being utilized in Wisconsin Rapids Public Schools, including Title I, II, and III. So we did it in five minutes. Yes, yeah, so she did it in five minutes. <laughs> and <we're not> <laughs> So with that, I make a motion to approve the Ed Services um, Report of Monday, December 1st, 2014. Second. Okay, my motion is second to approve the Educational Service Committee meeting minutes of December 1st, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mary. That was quite lengthy. <laughs> and next, agenda referrals and information requests. Does anybody have anything tonight? Okay, next we can move on to the legislative agenda we have tonight. Well, um, I, did, I did see uh, Representative Krug had a report, but there wasn't really anything on, anything that had to do with schools, so I just kind of let that go. The legislative update from our WASB, um, they talked about the Joint Finance Committee announcements and that our proposed resolutions are now in, which we discussed at our last meeting. Uh, the one thing of interest, which I think we heard at our um, seminar also, has to do with um, two education two education committees this year. Senator Majority Leader, uh, Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald recently announced state Senate committee assignments. Senator Luther Olson is once again chair of the Senate Education Committee. Fitzgerald also announced, however, the formation of a new committee on education reform and government operations chaired by Senator Paul Farrell. Last session, Olson and Farrell were often in disagreement on issues like school accountability, common core standards, and voucher expansion. Senator Olson has stated publicly that while he wants to work with colleagues on these issues, it was likely that the more conservative Senate elected in November would attempt to go around him. That appears to be the case. So I'm, that, that was pretty strong at that seminar, and I think that is going to be the case. So that's all I have. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? All right. Thank you. Mary, we'll move on to the bills. Okay, and I would make a motion that the receipts be noted and the bills be paid as printed. Second. Okay, motion is second that the receipts be noted and bills paid as printed. Uh, do you have a roll call, please, Marie? Mr. Cranks? Yes. Mrs. Rayle? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Mrs. Hutt? Yes. Okay, we'll move on to new business now. The first item up for discussion and possible action is regarding employee health insurance contributions amount for the food service employee group. 
Do you want to start? Or? I'll give an, uh, just an overview. Um, our food service employees, um, current, their current um, contribution um, is 85%. The board contributes for single, and the board contributes 50% for family. That is the only group that falls into that category. All other groups have 85% for both single and for family. And um, currently we have one employee who is a family, uh, takes family um, insurance and is required to pay 50% of that premium. So up for discussion is, um, is the board interested or, or considering or looking at um, moving that group towards you know, where the other groups are as far as 85% contribution. And so there was, Ryan, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. We had some conversation, um, some brief conversation about that when we were discussing health insurance as a whole and, and premiums and costs and what we're going to be doing for savings in the future and so on. Yeah, I, I have some, some figures that I can refer to regarding contribution dollar amounts um, if, if there are specific questions from the board. Um, but some other detail that I also brought along to share is that within um, within the food service group, uh, we currently have 34 employees that are in the, the food service group. Um, out of out of that group, um, there are 21 of the 34 that are eligible for health insurance based on their status of working 30 hours or more per week. Within that, that 21 that are currently eligible, uh, 16 are taking, have elected to take single plans. We have one of, of those uh, 21 are taking the family plan. And there are, are four employees that have declined to take the coverage. One of the things that that um, has come up at least internally within the administrative team when reviewing this is um, if the change were to take place, is there a possibility or maybe even a likelihood of the 16 that are taking single plans now, the possibility or likelihood of them switching to, possibly switching to family plans if that, that rate <coughs> is adjusted. Um, it, from our, our review of, of the information there, for example, it, it appears as though 12 of the 16 that are currently on single plans are married, for example, and, and may have an interest based on that change in, in rates to switch to a family plan, which is something to, for the board to consider as well. Um, and in addition to that would be the four that have declined to take coverage. Um, all of them appear to be married and may have an interest if those rates change to take on the plan, take on a family plan, um, if the adjustments were to be made, if an adjustment were to be made of, of some sort. Um, so if, six, if 16 taking single were to switch, it's about, what does it cost about single to family, it's about $9,000 or? Well, the, the yeah, correct. If the the district's obligation on coverage the difference if if an individual if um, for example if the eligibility were to, were to switch to, to covering the district covering 85 percent of the family plan when you take the current amount that the district pays for the employee which is just under six hundred dollars per month for a single plan if the districts are covering 85% of the family plan and they switched, that monthly rate for the board is about 1350, 1350. That's per month, which is a difference of just over $750 per month. You multiply that times 12 months, it's a little over $9,000 per employee. That, that would be the cost if the coverage is switched to 85% family coverage for every single current single plan switching to a family plan, the district's obligation would go up a little over nine thousand dollars. Multiply that times, you know, the the twelve of sixteen, and that's obviously an extreme example. But if all twelve were to switch, it's about a hundred and not quite a hundred nine thousand dollars. Those dollars come out of the fund fifty, not out of the general fund. 
you're familiar with 150 as a full service fund. <coughs> The, the other um, example then would be um, the situation with the other four that are currently, I mean, again, these are extreme examples, but if, if the four that are not taking coverage at all were to pick up a family plan, uh, the, the total there is almost $65,000 in annually in premium coverage. So the total on, on all of that, and again, this is obviously the extreme example of all switch to families, it'd be $174,000 annually. And as, as Dr. Dickman just indicated, the, the benefits for food service employees come out of Fund 50. The you know, food service program is, is self-funded in, in essence from revenue that's generated through the program. That's where all of the, the, the cost here involved would be, would be coming from. Further questions or thoughts or comments? Well, changes with this mean to the program, the food service program, if any. There has to be some. Well, food service currently has a has a, a fund balance. Um, but that it would, would be, be well, that would be depleted. Yep. Um, and, and then Well, I, Who knows? it depends. It depends on what what the actual cost is, how quickly that's depleted. Um, it also it also um, depends on on you know how many of these how many of these individuals actively actively seek to make a change. Um, you know, we don't know if we're going to if the food prices will go up. We don't know. You know, if, if with our facility study, if, if, you know, if there were to be a school closure down the road somewhere, or, I mean, you know, all kinds of things can impact. Um, but more immediately, it would be, you know, it's, it's a financial. Would it be significant or would it be minor? Financially? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's close to $200,000 a year. If, if all employees here, I think that would be the change in, in cost for what, what's currently paid, but well, all other groups have 85% coverage. So, so what's the history? How did it come about that this group didn't get it? Back when there was a collective bargaining agreement, um, food service had single plans for free, and we paid that same dollar amount towards family plans. Then, when there was a change made um, to 85%, because it was it was bumped up, actually bumped down for the single people to, to 15%, they'd have to pay. Um, we then moved the contribution up to 50%, and that was actually an increase over what that single contribution had been. So it was it was an improvement. I mean, it was a you know lesser. It was more of a cost for the singles, but less of a cost for a family. So it's been through a you know a manner of, of changes over the years. What changes will we see with the Affordable Care Act? I know that there's some legislation in there about keeping things consistent across all your plans. Um, I don't think that's being enforced yet, but when that does, we would need to do that to be compliant, correct? Yeah, very likely, yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what we we've been advised. We don't have the discrimination rules out yet, but right. they're anticipated. The, the, you know, the, the, the one other figure is, okay. is on the, you know, the opposite side of this, and that is if the board were to move this to 85% and everything stayed the same for the 21 that are currently qualified and that I referenced, um, which would mean just one employee the increase to the district would be about six thousand seven hundred dollars and annually. So that you know, again, it, it's it's difficult to predict or project what may or, or may not happen here. Um, but we we don't feel it's as simple as it staying the same as as what the current breakdown um, shows. Um, it, it obviously would be a significant increase in benefit, and and may very well depending upon 
what other coverage these employees are, are seeking for their spouses or their families, it may be much more cost effective to switch to a family plan with the district at, at the rates and the level of benefit that's offered at, at an 85% coverage even versus for, what they're doing even now. for the decline, if they perhaps have family insurance through a spouse, our plan may be richer and they may decide to make that change. So even, if, even though they've declined currently, they've perhaps declined because of the cost. Is, the, um, is there an open window for employees to enroll in the plan, or is it open at all times? It, it, it's open at, at all times. The, the only adjustments we've really seen is when people ha have been affected by what would be considered a qualifying event. Right. Because I know where I work, uh, we have a window in the fall, October. So if you don't have it now, you, I mean, unless there was a qualifying event change, you wouldn't be eligible to go in until next fall. I was just wondering if we would know that now. I mean, by that time, we might have a better idea by next fall what was coming with the discriminatory language in the ACA. We may have been forced by then to do it anyway. And I certainly don't want it to appear that the health, the food service employees are viewed any different than any other employees in our district. They're not. We value all of our employees. This is something that was brought in front of us to discuss. So. Um, <coughs> I'd have to, have to agree with the 85% uh, every meeting I've been to about the affordable health care act is the discrimination part we'll be putting in. And I believe it's at the end of this year that that's supposed to go in and for starting next year. I don't think that's been... But that hasn't been finalized. The last, last two meetings we had, they said it was originally going to be this past year, but then they bumped everything back one full year. Um, well, and... You know, that's that's one reason to do it, but also, yeah. just from a personal standpoint, it seems like the right thing to yes. do. Well, common sense, yeah. I mean, we can't, I, I, I've, I personally think we need to have equality across all, all plans, so I would certainly recommend that we move it to 85%. I, I agree with John. I, you know, I think if, it, if they all, if it all ends up and it's a money issue, then we deal with it. But you know they're they're equal employees, and um, I I think we need to do. It. Everybody works the same for the same amount of dollars. I mean, we all work hard. We're working hard for our district. Uh, okay, so, I'd entertain a motion. Okay, so I guess I would make a motion then to modify the board's contribution for family insurance for food service personnel from fifty percent to 85% contribution effective January 1st, 2015 to bring the group in line with other employee groups with the payment to be made from Fund 50. Second. Did you, did it say family in there? <laughs> yes, family okay. insurance. Yeah. Contribution for family insurance. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion a second to modify the board's contribution for family insurance for food service personnel from the current 50% contribution to 85% contribution effective January 1, 2015 to bring the group in line with other employee groups with the payment to be made from Fund 50. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next we can move on to discussion and possible action concerning board communication and public education advocacy efforts. I guess I'll jump into this since I started it. Um, Mary, Sandy, Ann, and I attended the um, 2014 Legislative Advocacy Conference uh, in September, or excuse me, November 8th, and uh, did find some sad news that we're losing State Representative Steve Castell, who was uh, the Assembly's um, stalwart, basically, for education. And, um, and he fought hard for education, just now we lost Amy Sue and uh, several other legislators that were strong in education. Um, so it's going to be interesting. And the bottom line is, is that after leaving this, I mean, this is one of the best conferences that I, I, I have attended since I've been on the school board and went to some of these Wasby conferences. Um, very informative. Um, Dr. Julie Mead from UW-Madison gave a a very good PowerPoint of which I've got some stuff um, and I shared a, a lot of the information with the fellow board members but it's key and, and one of the keys that Luther Olson said to us was that 
advocacy. You know, the only way they're going to be heard is if you if you speak. And he said, you can't speak by yourself. Like if you go to the joint finance, when they have the joint finance committees, uh, you need to go in group and have everybody speak. It could be a long and lengthy process, but he said the only way they're heard, people are heard, and they take note of it, is that there's multiple people talking about the same thing. And it may sound repetitive, and sometimes they may limit it, but um, he said for the most part, everybody has two minutes to say their piece, and if you all say your piece about one specific, they, they, it might drive drive the point into them, and they might uh, say, hey, maybe we need to take a look at this, and it does make some sense. Um, so as a part, uh, uh, and I don't think we can really make a lot of actions today, but uh, because this is going to be a, an ongoing thing. But one of the things that Steve Castell <coughs> Castell did is they had a bi-monthly meeting with their legislators, and then they had this they, they had a meeting point with local government, schools, anybody they wanted to attend, and it wasn't a complaint session; it was a discussion, so that. They could hear what we were looking for, they could hear what city government were looking for, and, and they had this dialogue going. And it seemed to be very effective because what they were saying is that these legislators would stand up and say, hey, I'm not showing up there, people will start talking about it. That so, was when he was on the school board, right. is what you're saying, not when he was a legislature. In no, the, yeah, he, when he was on the school board. But he was a legislator too, and they did do that in, in the Sheboygan area. So that's one of the things that I was thinking that we, you know, we have our consortium, consortium meetings, but try to get a time with the legislators where the school boards can come and, and meet and have that type of discussion because it's going to be very important. I mean, quite frankly, we're uh, you know, public education is under attack, and it's not they're not hiding it. I mean, the, the Republican control is not hiding it. Um, so some of the talking points we were talking about were, you know, Common Core standards and, and the misnomers of that. Uh, the public school advantage. Um, question legislators and, and do it in a positive at atmosphere, but then not only if you do have an issue or a problem or, or some dis discussion point with them, you want to give them a solution or offer them some sort of answer to the question or some sort of solution so that they at least you can't just push you aside and say, well, I've heard it, we're doing something about it. Um, one of the things that as a school board they were talking about is making resolutions um, to different things if, you're, if you feel that strongly about it. Um, one of the, the, the big things is testing, the opt-out part of it for private education. And they don't hide it. These, these people out there, they literally pull their people to opt out of testing. So what fairness and equality is that if you're not if you're getting vouchers and, and they're getting a voucher money and they're opting out of the testing programs? Um, being vocal about public dollars being used for the used as the same rules, so that everybody's on the same page. Um, basically, the stats are is, when you start looking at they're they're talking about. We're so much better, the private schools are doing that, but when you really look at an apple to an apple comparison, when you take the top 10% of your public schools versus the top 10% of these other schools, public schools are actually doing better than, than the private schools. Um, basically, we need to talk, you know, talk with the legislators and get the issues and needs out there and make sure they, they understand that. Now, along with that, I just got in a in the mail Monday, I believe it was, or Saturday, I mean, the um, WASB resolutions for the uh, conference. So um, I'm just starting to look at those and, and bring those forward for the next meeting before I go down to conference. I guess we really need that to be added for the next meeting. Well, I can remember a few years ago we had discussion about uh, public relations. And you think, why would you take tax dollars that you need in the classroom and spend it on public relations? And you almost think that we are being forced to do that to attract people to our public schools. It just seems strange to me that we would have this discussion, but we don't do a real good job of publicizing ourselves. I mean, public education, 
This is the backbone of this country, and you wouldn't think you should have to wave your own flag, but it seems like we're at the point, state of Wisconsin, that we need to. And I'm not sure exactly the best way to go about doing it, but I think we have to start some way. Um, there's an article in yesterday's paper, um, Voucher Advocates Spent Big on Attacks on you know, Electing People. Uh, one of the scariest articles I've read lately, it's um, Scott Jensen representing American Federation for Children. They, they targeted people that were, you know, for vouchers, got them elected. It's all out of state, big money, Republican money. Um, this is huge. Um, it's just, you know, not local. We can talk to our local representatives, but they had big money backing them to get elected. Um, it's just an attack on public education. And like John said, when you look at the, the facts and figures, public schools do better than the voucher or private schools do. It's, you know, you can, I guess, get figures to say anything, but when it comes down to it, they're doing, we're doing a darn good job. Um, and I don't know how, you know, we're looking at Gates, we're looking at Koch brothers, you know, an infinite source of money. I think we have to get it to our parents. You know, I think that's where I have to see group, is I think the parents that we have with their students, they're happy with what's happening in the classroom. And I think they have to become vocal. And I, I agree with Sandy because, you know, I've been on the school board 14 years and, and I've been to the Capitol quite a few times and I've talked to legislators at different meetings and I don't believe that they don't know. I, I really believe that there are a lot of them, I, I do believe to, certain, to a certain extent that that's true, they, they need to hear us. But I know that I've sat in there and talked to them, and they hear us, and they go and do exactly, and they and they'll talk to your face and say yes, 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 and then they'll they'll be on the floor and they'll be saying something. It's like, did you hear what I said? Um, it was it, it has to do with school funding. It was when we changed the start of school date. Those were all issues, you know, that people went on. And I, I think it's we have to start with our with our parents, with our community, um, if it's views on issues and, and maybe it's inviting maybe it's inviting legislators and parents and somehow trying to get get that kind of a meeting or have the legislators I would love to see them go into a school and sit in a regular and, s and really see what goes on in the classroom because I don't think I mean I know that myself as a parent until I was in there I didn't realize it and I live here in, in this community so I think there are th certain things we can do but um, uh, the issue about talking faith, I think to have them here is good. I, I do, but I I really um, have lost a lot of faith in that they really do listen to what we say. Well, we have a consortium meeting coming up this winter, mm -hmm. February, we're thinking. Mm -hmm. How do we publicize that to the parents in our district, that it's important that they take time to show up? I mean, that's their one opportunity to sit in front of multiple legislators and speak to them in a forum that's open and candid. They can talk to them on the side. But I know one time we had one over here in the cafeteria that was you know, pretty acrimonious <coughs> time, but we had a good turnout. Um, other times when we've had the legislators and we haven't had such a good turnout, I think it would hold sway with them if they had 100 people sitting in an auditorium or if you have so many people you have to move it to the PAC or Lincoln's cafeteria, whatever it is, to see that there are that many people that are concerned about public education. Even if they don't speak, that they're there to support. I think that would go a long ways. So how do we go about, I mean, we've got our website, we've got our newsletters that go out in all of our schools. We could Facebook and Twitter. Facebook, Twitter. Um, well, I think even actually understanding, you know, what things are, like Common Core. I mean, I've heard so many comments from people about, you know, and I think they, some of them look at it as when we changed our math program to the, you know, core math. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think a lot of people really understand um, it, it, all of these things, the testing, the, the, the teacher accountability, the student, I mean, the, the, you know, I really think somehow we need to get that out there. I don't really know how, but. Well, maybe we could develop some type of handbook that we could attempt to hand out that would explain some of these things. Um, a flyer or like something. Like the myth versus the truth on the Common Core standards. The testing requirements that are required in our public schools that are not required in, in the voucher schools. The accountability that we have to have meetings like this in a public school and private school just doesn't have to they can tend to their business however they see fit and again that kind of goes back to the PR but I think if people understand maybe they would be more willing to be involved because let's face it most folks are busy you know it's uh, 
if you understand the fight you're up against, it's a little easier to fight it. And voting is, I mean, Sandy's right. The money, it, you know, mm -hmm. we, we aren't yeah. going to be able to compete with the money. Well, and here's the thing. This is what Julie had said, that the reason that privatization and the Republicans are looking at it so bigly is public education is a 500 plus billion dollar enterprise nationwide. Basically, the greedy want this money. And the bottom line is private is for profit, bad for kids. Then she went on to say that K-12, which is the large, state's largest private virtual, commercial, virtual, private virtual, um, virtual school or program in the state, CEO. the CEO of K-12 makes $2.3 million a year. And how, like where, 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 uh, the next question is this, how many of your superintendents or any of your students, you know, anybody in your district is making anything close to that? So we're using public dollars to fund private CEOs that get $2.3 million a year. But um, that in itself ought to send up a red flag to people. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize that. You know, it's for profit. Yeah, it's for profit. And we've seen the, the, the cases of the guy that uh, basically pillaged the state for $2.5 million and happened to move to Florida and build a $2.4 million house. And now he's doing the same program down in Florida. But um, basically your ending slide was be proud, be loud. Public schools outperform private schools. Public schools outperform charter schools. Public schools where poverty rates were under 10% scored the highest among the highest in the world. Public schools where the poverty rates of 10 to 25% of the student body scored among the top few nations of the world. The public school advantage is why public schools outperform private schools, and we do. So those are the things that we have to get out, and we have to make it a, um, the biggest thing is the accountability, and they're, they're, still, they're still wrestling with that. I mean, they were saying that they still don't have the framework and the computer software to these people, and it won't be there till next year for these private schools to record their testing data of all, because all, right now the state did change or pass the law where all voucher schools, or voucher funded students, not all students in the private school, just the voucher funded students have to have accountability to testing and that type of thing. Uh, however, the DPI doesn't have that software done and they, they think it's they, their quote, which kind of made, made my hair stand up, it's a burden to some of these people to get this done, and it's like, <laughs> what? You know, the burden that we had to have the testing, you know, and all of the things that the state and, and federal government mandate on school, private or public schools, is a burden too. One thing I would like to see, and I I talk to people continually about this, and um, and after a while their eyes glaze over. I don't know what to say, but if we were to uh, talk about the things that's going that will happen to students in our district if these continual cuts keep coming through, maybe they'll start to listen because they're going to be coming. Maybe in the next year, um, you can slowly take the money away from things, uh, and things sort of totter and move down, but you don't see it, <clears throat> especially if uh, people are dedicated to what they do, and they would do it whether they were hurt or not. Um, so we are continuing to do that. We continue to do more for less, our people are, because they're dedicated. And when does this get to be uh, a burden? Now, I, I said this one other time. And when uh, Re Representative Krug was here, um, here comes Katie. Her just sneaked in. We're ready for your comments, but not yet. Good. <laughs> I have a, a niece who is, uh, she is a wonderful teacher. And last, uh, she's an orchestra teacher in Colorado, and her last year there, um, five of her eight senior kids in her orchestra said they wanted to be orchestra teachers. She was that good. Best in Colorado. Well, they went to Germany for two years, and the first 80000 of income is tax-free for teachers, for both she and her husband. Um, 
That's how they te treat teachers in Germany. Now she's coming back to find a, a job. <laughs> and I'd love to have her right here in Wisconsin Rapids or in Wisconsin someplace. But you think I could attract her with the present situation? No, we're not going to get our finest and best because she's, she's going to find Singapore or somewhere in the world that will take uh, she and her husband. And, you know, that's not the best. We can do better than that. And uh, we have to find a way to explain this. And I don't know what it is, but maybe some of the stuff we're going to have to cut would get people's attention. Um, we've got librarians, we've got counselors, uh, we've, uh, class sizes are higher. Um, you know, uh, I'm frustrated. So uh, sometimes I think, let's just violate one of these rules and see what they do to us. <laughs> well, I thought a lot about that, Larry, but they take our funding away. Yeah, <laughs> that's the and that really things. puts me in a tight spot. But I'm uh, area. Let's have a meeting and maybe sort of negotiate something with the teachers and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we negotiated a long time. We got along, didn't we? We had a bargaining where people really got together. Isn't, isn't that what it's supposed to be? Respect for both sides, you know? Now, why can't we still do it? I don't know. So I, I'm uh, rubble. We still have respect for both sides. So I, hasn't think, changed. I think there's yes, respect we on both sides. I, I, mean, I didn't mean that. There was respect right. for both sides, the way we bargained. And it was a good way to do it. And now we can't do it. We just do whatever we want. Basically, we can say, oh, that, this is what we're going to do. That's not fair. That's I not think respect. another challenge, too, is trying to keep the message positive. Um, you know, we want the legislators to come in. We want them to hear what we have to say. So if we have a preconceived notion of what their beliefs are based on their party affiliation, uh, that doesn't help us That's going to be hard for me. But my, me too, Larry. But, but they are elected officials, better or worse, they're who we have to deal with. That's going so. to take a lot of patience. But you can We've done it before. We just need to continue to do it. I think we can show a little impatience and a little frustration. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I really do. I really think it's, you know. My niece is not going to come to us. But I agree. We are, it isn't going to be a bashing of no. them because then it doesn't, doesn't help. No. I think we have to have specifics. This is how we've been hurt mm -hmm. financially right. because of your decisions. Boom, boom, boom. Right. This is the dollar amount. This is what has happened. <coughs> um, I agree. Rather I was thinking than about this open enrollment business. I mean, what benefits have people gotten out of that? And how much time have we spent trying to figure this out? <laughs> and how much stress is in there? I mean, you can't make a mistake on this stuff. What benefits have is come out of that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they tell us to do it, and we have to do it, and if we don't do it, I don't know. But and on the other hand, too, we have to tell them exactly how we have been beneficial, how we have been great in this district. You know, on the different articles in the paper, on the on our district website, you know, there's all these nice little blurbs of all the things, you know, acknowledgments that individual teachers, students, and groups have gotten. And I think we just have to lay that right out to them. You know, we are successful. And that's good, but I, I think that in a way that, that, I mean, it's great that we can do so well with what they give us, but then they look at them and they say, see, you're fine, and you can probably do with even less now because you guys are doing great. And, you know, they don't, the idea of you get what you pay for, it just isn't a concept for them. And when they see we're doing great things, we're doing wonderful things, our teachers are amazing, you know, the schools are doing wonderful things. So maybe we have too much money, they're thinking. I, that's what it seems like. Every time we do something better, they take something else away. What I fail to understand is the, is, is the lack of connecting the dots in the sense that if you take money away from the public school, which we in turn spend in the private sector, whether we're an employee spending the salary that we're paid, or as a school district, we purchase the software that we use that goes to a private sector business. Mm -hmm. sure. If you take dollars away, those things are going to, going to diminish. Secondly, you're, there's also a failure to connect the fact that if we're not paying a decent wage, attracting the brightest people and keeping you know who we have, um, Eventually, you know, you across the state, you'll have difficulty finding educators. Then there'll be a shortage. Then you'll have to pay more to get one. It, <laughs> well, it's a supply and demand. I mean, it. it and then the, the, the other part that that brings that is not good for education 
nor maybe the ministry or other things, uh, merit this and merit that. Uh, people, administrators, custodians don't say, hey, look at me. I'm doing a little extra. Can I get some merit pay? We don't need that in education. That is not constructive. We don't, uh, I'm a former teacher. I never taught for that reason, to get seen and to get ahead of somebody else. That they're leading us in that direction too. Mm -hmm. Compete against the district next to you because, you know, uh, show how you're doing it better or, you know, put up a sign or uh, whatever. Billboard. <laughs> one, of, one of the resolutions that I was reading about at the uh, convention is, is dealing with that, with tech, tech education and the fact that there's a huge shortage of tech ed teachers in the state and um, to put it bluntly, basically that school districts are poaching from each other to get tech ed teachers. Um, also in the... Spanish you know, teachers. It's hard to get to, I think. No, I don't think that. that well, it's the... Um, <laughs> The uh, special education teachers are also in, in tough, yes. tough demand right now. So there are issues, in the, and they're, they're, the you know, WASB is looking forward, or looking, and, and some of the resolutions deal with that as far as school start date and, and trying to get be more creative with how you do, and flexible with tech edge teachers and, that, and, and different teachers with different licensures can fit into that thing for a temporary position or different different avenues to resolve that problem. But the bottom line is, is, is and Luther Ol Olson um, said it at the meeting here with, with us, is that the state can't fund the, which the state statute says, legislature shall provide by law for the establishment of district schools, which shall be as nearly uniform as practical and such schools shall be free and without charge for tuition to all children between ages 4 and 20 years. The uniformity clause, which has been challenged by the Supreme Court a couple of times. But the bottom line is, is that by law, public schools are to be funded by the state. Now, Luther Olson says we can't figure out how to do that. How are we going to fund two other school systems, basically two hour systems of schools with vouchers and, and the um, charter schools uh, when we can't even fund this one. So there are people that are aware of it, but the, the bottom line is is privatization people, which are the minority, but and it's more out of state because if you look at every, the people involved with Common Core, against the Common Core, are all out of state. They're all people, Florida, Texas, you know, all different parts. And if you look at the, the majority of the Republican funding money, very few dollars come from state funding. It's all from out of, out of state privatization people that want to make everything private and make it for a buck rather than what it's really intended for. And it's for the education of students. And one of the things I thought maybe as far as the school board, you know, and then that type of thing is that I don't know if we want to kind of look at writing some of the things as far as writing a, a little article or a my view or a our view type of thing on some of this stuff and, and, and put the facts out there. Those are the things that kind of things are that for as far as us on advocacy in the in the local sector is to, to see if we can you know, get something to pay for or something on um, public access channel. And thank you Jesse for very much for coming. Um, and that type of thing, but uh, those are the, the things that we could probably do locally, at least to start with them, as well as talking to our uh, our, our legislators and, and getting the points across. But you know, the bottom line is, is that's let's look at the other side of the card. They may have already made up their mind, waiting for February to get everybody all signed in, and all of a sudden they're going to just ramrod like they did all the other bills that they've done. You know, and they're already decided. So. We don't know that, but oh, we it's not supposed to work that way. But that seems Skyward was a perfect example of the public spoke. Yeah, and the rules changed, so mm -hmm. we have to hold out hope that we can do it again. But it needs to be more than seven people. So, well, districts want their money to afford the Skyward priests, right? And so, <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's get so, our cheese head hats on and march down there. <laughs> So our I guess I have a question. Our consortium meeting, I mean, we've never really invited the public, have we, to that? 
it's, it's an open public meeting. Yeah, I understand. But it's not fun yeah. to speak. It's, it's <clears throat> board members to sit and have conversation with, you know, about whatever the topic happens to be. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we've decided to invite legislators. Um, Maureen is still waiting to hear. We had several um, boards respond, and we're waiting on a couple, and then we'll go out and shoot the invite out to all the legislators um, from all the districts that do decide to come. Well, maybe we could designate we'll a public. maybe we could designate a period of time before the meeting started that could be public comment time, or after. I mean, I'm just thinking that if the public comes in, they have the opportunity to speak. I know that that's a consortium meeting for the boards to speak with the legislators, but that is an opportunity for the legislators to hear from the constituents as well. So if we just designated a time for public comment. Then you certainly want the legislators to be aware of that. Right. Because Absolutely. they don't control public comment. Absolutely. But I'm just thinking that it's an opportunity for people to be <clears throat> or, or if at that meeting, at the consortium meeting, we talk about that with board members, with our consortium, and see if that's something, I, I don't know. I. I think there needs to be some education. And I think that's what the consortium would offer to a certain degree, is some education to the public. Because I do think there's confusion about what Common Core is. There is confusion about a lot of these issues. And I think before we um, offer a public comment time, we need to do some education. How can we do that? Well, that's what I... I, I think she's saying maybe... I, I um, agree. Yeah, I, I know. I just think that's... the best way to do that? I think... I don't know what the best way is to do it, But I know that we've been to several WASB meetings um, and heard superintendents talk about their newsletter. That's Now, I know that there's been discussion in this district about that and how many of those perhaps just get circular filed but these people seem to think that it, it works. Um, that's one thing. Our news, our um, website, our mm -hmm. you know Facebook, Twitter, all those things. And that's you know way back when two superintendents ago, I talked to with our superintendent said you know we need somebody in the district who can c compose some of that kind of stuff. And you're, what you're talking about public relations person. And apparently this district at one time did have a public relations person, but we, if we can't afford librarians, we can't afford a public relations person is, is what. Well, well, that, that was part of the, part of the, I guess, thought behind, you know, talking to Maria and saying, okay, we need to move on to Facebook and Twitter because people are, are looking for social media. Um, I thought that would be a good way for us to kind of brag about what we're doing and, and you know, present some of those, mm -hmm. those things that might not make it into a newspaper or, you know, River City's access wouldn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that was a good way to get it out there. To, to say, hey, we are, you know, mm -hmm. to tell the story, we are doing some good things. Yeah, and I think we're, we yeah, just really started a mm -hmm. good job on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I've learned some things. Um, you know, maybe with a consortium, you need, you need an expert to come in because, you know, if you live here, you don't know anything, you're not an expert. But, like, the, it was a Julie Mead. And she's only on Madison. Maybe the consortium could, you know, get some people like that to come. Like, they, you know, they had the um, professor from Green Bay that was here. He was in Marshfield in the fall and he was here not too long ago. Gosh, gosh. Um, you know, perhaps something like that would have a greater impact. Julie Bean is pretty good. I mean, I, would, I was going to contact her and ask her if she had any type of flyers or ideas how we could put together a flyer and, um, and look at that. And Mary and I had been to another one where there was a fellow that worked with the voucher charter program. Well, and they left and from switched Oshkosh, from Oshkosh. Oshkosh. Yeah, was and he was very good saying, you know, public schools are performing on him. He had all the data to back it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. He did a complete 360. But would that be another consortium meeting? Is that what well, you're you know, would, would the consortium members, members even consider going in on something like that? You know, you're going to probably have to pay a speaker or whatever, but... <sighs> Could they have that on our time to rough. speak to when we meet as a consortium? Or we can use that, or even have, have, have her come in and speak to the community if she'd be willing to Well, the community will open up the pack or something, yeah. but, you know, you've got some 
close school districts that I think mm -hmm. would benefit from it also. Yeah. I mean, her message is strong, uh, and, and she is a very, very true and has all the facts to back up the fact that public schools are, are providing, outperforming private and vouchers and charters and the whole, whole nine yards in the, in the majority of the sectors. I mean, there are some sectors where it's a couple percentage points one way or the other, but for the most part, uh, you know, it's 8 to 10 to 12 percent better in the public schools than the private schools. And you take anybody who comes. That's right. That's the other thing you said. Well, the other thing is, you know, if you look at us as a workforce, we're about 700 strong. Thanks, yeah. Everybody's telling the story I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, the good things that the district's doing. It's also Jamie Ballmer, isn't it, and the blueberries? Yeah. You know? We, yeah. we take all the blueberries. Yeah. The green ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you have the other point. Uh, there are public or private schools that if the student doesn't perform, they boot them back out so that it doesn't blemish their record. So they boot them back out to the public schools. And that happens quite a bit. So I guess getting back to the yeah. consortium and meeting and how we would handle it. Um, I don't know about having a real, you know, a lot of public. I guess we, because I'm afraid if you get. Well, we, I don't think we should have a public comment. We should just, okay. we need to have a meeting. We need to get. I think we need to have a meeting with public. Right. But I think that's, what I think our, our consortium needs to talk about right. how we could do that. Because I think we should, and I think then, and that we're all, that we all have this, if we believe the same message, to have the same message. Okay. Um, are, you talking, are you talking public comment? To the legislators? Not at this meeting. No, I'm talking about no, having another consortium meeting. I don't know what it would be. It would no. be public, probably not public comment no. to them, but that somehow we could get the message out. First of all, exactly what we're talking about. Because I think, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. We need to, but we need, the bottom line is, is we need to have an open line of communication with both from us to them and then from them to us. So that we're all talking about the same things and understanding what we're talking about, and that's what we need. To, as far as the consortium, that would be a better one because now we have not just this district; we have eight districts involved. I mean, that's the bottom line: is that we have to we have to do it now and clear. Well, it might, might be a question for the legislators, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how can we, as a group, since? Yeah, and that's the whole part of the communications. Okay, you keep telling us you want to hear from us. How do you want to hear from us? And I guess I would hope that they wouldn't be afraid to, I mean, to even to, you know, to be in front of a, maybe an angry crowd. I mean, because hopefully they could give us some reasons why they're doing what they're doing. And if it's because there's billions of dollars behind them, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> You're talk we're talking about two thing, different things here. I mean, you... First, we're talking about the consortium that is coming up, but you're also talking about a topic to discuss at a consortium meeting is how do we all get the word out? That might not be the topic for this coming consortium meeting. Oh, yeah. I think we got some agenda items couple, right. for that meeting for discussion, what I'm yeah. hearing so today. Yeah, I mean, but that's two different mm -hmm. things. How do we have our, our joint voice heard? Right. What's the best right. avenue? Presented, but that's because as John said, yeah. if we've got half a dozen or eight school districts, now we got a lot of people. Right. We're not just one community then, so I think that would be one of our discussion points. Well, we don't we don't have. I mean, that could be you know number one on the agenda, and then we invite the legislators to come at six thirty or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the individual who replaced you, um, Amy Sue, lives in Toma, so it's going to be mm -hmm. quite a, quite a trip for her if she decides to come. So. You know, for her to get here at six, I don't know what her day entails, but we have a name. We're aiming for a Monday night, and um, most legislators are in their districts on a Monday or on Friday, because those sessions are usually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I guess I would encourage any of us that feels that they can or would want to, some way publicize. If it's a letter to the editor, if it's a blog entry, if it's something sent to Maureen to put on Facebook, feel free. I mean, if there's any of the professional staff that wants to send anything to us or central office that would like to be publicized. We're not in the buildings every day. I mean, 
unfortunately our time around schools is probably very limited, so we'd like to hear those things. It would be good if, if board members decide to put something out, though, to send it through us. Yes. So we can That's, yes, yes, that was going to be okay. yep. another. Sure. Yep. Um, Check mine because I'm so. angry. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was thinking, Larry. Um, this would be redacted for so a couple of years. So if we look at the agenda for the no, consortium, no, no, no. One, one thing we might put out there for the board to consider is how do we have a, you know how do we have our joint voice heard? You know what kind of action can we take? Is there is there something else that? I guess how can we reform that group? There was at one time we had Port Edwards, Nacoosa, and Wisconsin Rapids met every quarter. And that kind of fell by the wayside because it didn't seem like we had, we had a lot in common, but it didn't seem like we always had a lot that we talked about that we're, we're getting done. Um, then the Central Wisconsin Consortium, at one time I believe we had Marshfield, Stevens Point, it was at Lincoln's cafeteria. We had a oh, yeah, rather large Marshall, group, yeah, yeah, rather large group that they're night. They're all and invited every we've, time we've had a consortium. It's kind of... Uh, been set aside, I think. So I think one of the things we should discuss is how we can get that back operational and when we would meet. I mean, I, I don't think once a year is enough. The, and that might be the point where we have that quarterly meeting with the legislators, similar to what they did over in Sheboygan with yes. Steve Castell in that, in that group. That I would think the legislators would welcome that. I mean, if they know that they're going to meet every four months, with the group, they can put that in their calendar, and that gives them an opportunity to ask questions too. So, I also I also think what Sandy said about maybe having some kind of a speaker, at least to talk about that as a consortium, to see if the, what the rest of the group feels about that. But we somehow need to revitalize because because I think boards we are need to get our message just. Out. I mean, right. the mm -hmm. the big money is getting their message out, and. and basically slanderous and nobody challenges it. I mean... And it's not Stevens Point, Marshfield, Amherst, no. Port Edwards, and the Coos. It's no, public, it's education. public education. Yeah. So how can it's we get that word out? Anything else? I think we've got a good start. Uh, John deserves yes. some accolades for getting this started. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Okay. And looking at the calendars, we have a special Board of Education meeting closed and open session on the 15th. Uh, as a reminder, central office will be closed from December 24th to January 2nd. And a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to uh, everyone. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.